goodness. That is amazing. Good night. Yes. You know where hallelujah comes from, right? You know, it's a Hebrew word, or it's taken from a Hebrew word, a combination of Hebrew words, halal. There's seven words in the Hebrew for praise. One of the words is halal, and halal means to dance a jig before the Lord. Halal means to rejoice with great enthusiasm, to praise the Lord with great enthusiasm. And when the Lord, when Moses asked the Lord what his name was, he said, tell him I am has sent you. And then in the scriptures translated, or the Hebrew word is, uh, the English paraphrase is Yahweh. Actually, the name the Lord used was unpronounceable because it didn't contain any consonants. And the reason why is because the name was too holy to even pronounce. And so we, over the years, have substituted a few consonants so that we could pronounce the name. And so hallelujah is just a combination of the Hebrew halal, to praise and to dance a jig and to be foolish and rejoice before the Lord. Halal to Yah. Halal praised to Yahweh. And so when we say hallelujah, it means halal to Yah. And so that's what we would do. We would rejoice and be excited about the things that God would do. How many of you are excited about the things that God could do? Hey, praise the Lord. I am too. I am too. I tell you. It's a little bit hard to be excited all the time because uh, so many of the things seems, seem almost counterintuitive to what we're asking. But just hang in there, all right? Look at your neighbor and say, hang in there. Hang in there because it'll, uh, the answer will come to you. And many times the Lord uses his word uh, in places that you might not even be expecting that word to come. That's one reason why I believe it's really important to come to Bible teachings and to come to messages and to come to studies and, and come to prayer meetings and all of these kind of things because you never know where the answer is going to come from and who might be speaking it and what part of the word it might come I'm preaching through the book of Revelation. I'm saying this because I'm preaching through the book of Revelation. And I know many people that hear that you're preaching through the book of Revelation have one thing in mind, and that one thing, it, uh, one thing is the supernatural Star Wars uh, uh, mentality of the book of Revelation, which it is full of, and we will get into it. As a matter of fact, most of the book, from chapter 4 through chapter 22 is all about the, the battles of the end, the explosions of, of, a, of a world that's in judgment, that God is through with grace, that God is through with mercy, that mankind has had long enough, and the judgment of God is falling on humanity at the end, and and, 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 and that we're gone and the world is left in convulsions and it is doing all kinds of things that are just beyond our imagination and really almost beyond description. Well, people think, you know, okay, that's the book of Revelation, but the book of Revelation has many other things to say. And, and you'll remember in chapter 1, verse 19, that uh, he said, Here, here's the natural outline of the book. I'm going to, you know, God says to John, who is on the Isle of Patmos because he's been serving the Lord, not for being a criminal, but because he has been in the Word of God and he won't quit going into the Word of God. And he threatens the Roman Empire, 86-year-old preacher, banished to the Isle of Patmos, which is a, 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 which is a, a desert, deserted piece of rock out, out in the sea, you know, off of Sicily's coast, about 35 miles a little deserted desert island that's like a, a volcanic island that has caves and mines. And it is said by the historians that people had to work in the mines and it was hard labor and all of that. Here's an 86-year-old man banished to the isle because he's such a threat to the Roman Empire. Is an 86-year-old man. Why? Why, John? Are you a subversive? Are you a counter-terrorist or what are you? What kind of criminal are you? Well, he said, there are two things I'm there for. One is because I, I stood on the word of God. And number two, I wouldn't quit talking about Jesus. Now, what a testimony that is. And he said, all right, I want you to write these three things. And so the outline of the book of Revelation is really simple. 
Look at your neighbor and say, keep it simple. Keep it simple. I think simple is best. How about you? I mean, the simpler, the better, really, the more understandable it is. And he said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Write the things that are. And, of course, in chapter 1, we've already seen that. And the things that are is the glory of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 1, John is describing Jesus and his majesty and his power and what he looked like and his crown and his eyes of fire and his feet uh, representing judgment and the two-edged sword in his hand and all that. I mean, you just see the glory of Jesus Christ. So, John, what, 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 what are the things that, 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 that were? You know, what have you already seen? You've already seen Jesus Christ and the glory of God. So the first part of the book is write those things which you have seen. And then he goes, and secondly, the things that are. So he says, all right, John, we're going to show the world the way it is. And look at your neighbor and say, tell it like it is. Jesus looks at John and says, we're fixing to tell it like it is. We're going to show them how it is. And he chooses seven churches of the, of the Asian area that are right around there that, to represent the way things are. He's going to use them as examples and say, all right, tell them like it is. Here is how it is. And he says, write these letters to these seven churches right here locally, gathered around this general area. So people in this general area, when you say that church name, they'll have an identification with that church and they'll have some idea as to what's going on. And we'll use these seven churches as a way to show them the way things are. And then he says, and then we're going to show them what shall be hereafter. So the natural outline of the book given by Jesus Christ himself in verse 19 of chapter 1 is, write the things which you have seen, write the things that are, and write the things which shall be hereafter. So the first thing he begins to do is he begins to write in chapter 2 to these seven churches. And just as a reminder, you'll know that these seven churches are represent, I mean, if, you want, if you're looking for a way to apply this to your life and you say, why in the world would he give messages to seven churches and why would he use that type of format and so forth? Well, it's, it's because uh, the Spirit of God can use this information in such unique ways. And I'm saying this to you because I know that all of you are not historical people. I mean, you don't really get excited about historical things. So you, you say, man, what would, what would writing to some church 2,000 years ago that doesn't even exist anymore, what would that have to do with me personally? How would that affect my life? Well, remember, Jesus is writing the book. Jesus is the one speaking. It's not a letter from John. It's not a letter from the Holy Spirit. It's not a letter from an angel. This is a letter from Jesus Christ himself. Jesus who created the church, Jesus who died for the church, Jesus who established the church, Jesus, the one upon which our hope is built, is the one that is speaking to us and saying, I'm going to tell you like it is. You hear what I say because this is going to communicate to you how things are in your life, how things are in this world we live in, how things are in the spirit of your life. And so these seven letters begin to speak to us in different ways. And remember I told you that there were four ways that you could let these seven letters speak to you. I don't, you know, you don't really need to say, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, this is speaking this way to me right now. And then and again, well, this must be speaking this way to me. I mean, you know, or maybe it's this way. Yeah. I, I just want you to know that there are different ways that these seven churches are going to affect your life. And because of the inclinations of your heart, what, you're, what you are inclined to latch on to, the Holy Spirit is going to feed that with this information so that you can hear what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Not just what he said to some church years ago, but what is he saying to you? As a matter of fact, in every one of these letters, he ends it with saying, let him who has ears to hear hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. In other words, look at your neighbor and say, you have your ears on? Look at him and say, are you listening? That's what Jesus would be saying. At the end, he said, all right, here's the information. Then he says, are you listening? Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Because this is a word for you. This is not just some word to some lost church that doesn't even exist anymore. 
This is an example of you. This is, this is you, and I'm speaking to you. Are you hearing this? Are you letting this purge you and sanctify you and challenge you and connect you and condemn you? Because listen, this message that you're hearing is on this side of eternity. One of these days, it'll be too late, really. One of these days, the, the, the book will be closed and the opportunities will be over and you will not have an opportunity. You think you might. You say, whoo, pastor, you know, if I happen to miss the boat, uh, man, I mean, I'm going to know all this stuff that you're preaching. I'm getting my notes back out. And if I, if I look around and I notice that all of my Christian friends are gone and I'm still here, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, buddy. I'm going to repent. I'm going to run to an altar. I'm going to bow my heart. I'm going to get these notes out and I'm going to study. I'm going to say, whoo, here's what I need to do. Now, I know you're saying that to yourself, but I'm just telling you that that's not what you're going to do. You will not do that. You will believe the lie, according to 2 Thessalonians. In other words, God, the Bible says, he's going to send strong delusion. Not the devil's going to trick you, but that God himself is going to send a spirit of strong delusion that would, that, that, that would encourage everybody to believe whatever lie is spoken by whoever's in charge at that particular time about what happened. And, and you, you're not going to go to God. You're not going to interpret things. Your mind's not going to work like it works now. And I'm just telling you that the only time you have a chance to make a real choice is on this side of all of the events that are happening here. Most of us are encouraged today in our spirit, and I believe it's the Holy Spirit working us, to, to have a sense that time is short. You have a sense in you. I don't have to stand up here as your pastor and try to convince you that a lot of the things the Bible talks about happening in those last days before Christ returns for us and these terrible things begin to happen in the book of Revelation, that all of these things are at our doorstep. I don't, I, I, I don't think I really have to try to convince you of that. Most of you would just say, man, I see it happening every day. I watch the news. I watch the society. I look at those around me. I work with crazy people. I see, I see what's happening, you know, this spirit of unity around the world where everybody wants to be unified and everybody wants to be connected and united with each other. And we have all of these influences that every day encourage us to just become, to become one with everybody. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is a spirit of unity that is driving the world to be united in order to prepare it for uh, the control of a single person, a single entity in life. Yeah, yeah. And I'm telling you, every day you hear encouragements. Hey, let's not be Americans. Let's not be Africans. Let's not be uh, uh, Hispanic. Let's be just one big uh, amalgamated culture where nobody is really singled out individually, but that everybody are brothers and sisters and we work. And, and all that is, is, is the spirit of the age that is encouraging a united world that could be controlled by one single entity in life. So we see these things and we see them happening every day. We see other prophecies in the Bible, and the Bible is full of them, that, that tell us that these, this is the way it's going to be as the world approaches these last times and these last days. And you say to me, Pastor, when is this going to be? Well, I don't know. I, I don't. All I am is the voice of one crying in the wilderness, you know, make straight the paths of the Lord. But all I want to say to you about this is that the book of Revelation is intended to unveil some things for us, to reveal things to us. The book of Revelation is not a mystery book to us. It might have been mysterious to generations that have come before. They might not have been able to read this and to really, uh, the Spirit of God didn't enlighten it and didn't illumine it and, and, and they did the best they could and they tried to make it make sense and, and they tried to see what it might be saying, but, 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 but it might not have been, been the revelation that would be the, the end result because it wasn't time. But I believe in these last days that God's going to reveal things to you. I believe he's going to speak to your spirit about this. If you know him and you're a child of God, he's not only speaking to me as a pastor and a teacher, but he's speaking to you too. Yeah. 
And whenever you hear these things and you're encouraged to see these things and maybe you get a bit of information that's a little bit different than you've heard or you know or, or as we're all together, the Spirit of God moves in our midst and shows us things that none of us might have been thinking at the certain time. And the Holy Spirit applies these things to your life and to your heart and all of a sudden now you have a different understanding and a different view. And I'm just saying to you that, that I encourage you that, it, that throughout the study of this book, which is about 50 messages or more. I mean, it's a big book, and it has lots of information that you hang in there. Look at your neighbor and say, hang in there, man, because God's going to speak to your heart. I really believe that, and we start today with the way things are. We know that we live in a difficult world because uh, the parable of tares and wheat. Many of you know the parable of tares and wheat comes out of Matthew 13. You remember it. It said the good, the good man went out and he sowed in his field good seed. And then at night, the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, sowed bad seed among the good seed. And it began to grow. And the servants looked at him and came back to him and said, hey, Master, while we were asleep, an enemy has come in and sowed uh, bad seed and our good seed. And, and they're growing together out there. You want us to pull them up? And the master surprised everybody by saying, no, let them grow together. Because in pulling up the bad ones, you may pick some of the good ones instead. Because you can't tell the difference. Look at your neighbor and say, he's tricked you. Yeah, you call things good, bad, and things bad, good. Think about it. How many times have you looked at something and said, this is terrible, only to find out months later, this may be one of the best, greatest blessings of your life. So we can't tell good from bad. We don't know good from bad. And the master said, all right, no, tell him, let them grow together until, everybody say until, until the end. And at the end, I'll send the harvesters out, and the harvesters know the difference between the good and the bad, and the harvesters will take the tares and bundle them up and throw them in the fire, but the good will be preserved for us. And so this is a, this is, this is a word from Jesus about what it's going to be like in the end days. This is one of the reasons why it's so difficult for us, because this world is filled with good and bad mingled together. It's difficult to tell them apart. You say, why after 2,000 years are we still struggling the way we struggle? Well, it's because God has chosen to allow evil to stay mixed with righteousness in this world that we live in. And it's very difficult to make a dent into this because sometimes we call evil good and good evil and, and, and it's very hard to ferret out all of that kind of stuff. So one of the reasons we're still struggling after 2,000 years is that our mission on this earth is to minister the kingdom of God in spite of the fact that we're ministering it where evil is mixed with good. And according to Jesus himself, I know this sounds weird and it might sound, you know, uh, sacrilegious or something like that to you, but Jesus is saying, you know, the mixture of good and evil is good for my people. Hey, untangle that. Somehow he said, no, we're going to let them grow together. And it's like, well, if you pull up all the bad and you leave only the good, you might pull up some of the good. In other words, it sounds like Jesus is saying, I'm going to let the evil stay mixed with the good because it's, it's to the advantage of the good. Holy smokes. What? It's to my advantage to have my life challenged by the evil mixed with the good. That's right. And it's not going to happen until the end that the, the angels, the harvesters, are going to know the difference. You don't know the difference. They do. And they'll take away the tares. And then another reason we're having it such a struggle is because we're so small and our mission is so large. If you guys read the notes from last week, and I didn't get to preach it, that's why I'm saying something right now about it. But last week, you found these two things that I'm talking about. They're in your notes from last week. If you didn't read them, go back and you say, oh, yes, there they are. The second reason is because We've been given such a big job, and we're such a small group of people. Everywhere in the Bible where Jesus addressed the church, which is us, look at your neighbor and say, that's us. He said, I bless you, and then he uses this phrase, little flock. Implying what? Implying that we're going to be small in this world that we live in. Our mission is gigantic. What is our mission? 
Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What is our job? Take the gospel to the entire world. Wow. Seven, six point something billion people. Come on, Lord. We're a little tiny. Uh, uh, I'm with you, my little flock. <laughs> the apostle Paul said this, when he, I think he was talking to the Corinthians. He said, he said uh, 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 I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save, say the next word, some, not all. The apostle Paul said, I have become all things to all men so that I might by all means save some. So even the Apostle Paul said, I'm, I, I'm not going to be able to save everybody. I recognize that my job is overwhelming. My task is too big for me. And we are Jesus' little flock. And in comparison to the world with all of its billions of people and, 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 and billions of square miles of everywhere, we have been given an overwhelming job. And apart from the Spirit of God, it would be impossible for us to reach the world. You say, why are we having it so tough and why isn't all the world saved and why hadn't God's mission been accomplished? Well, it's because God still leaves evil and it's gonna grow with us until the end and that makes it extremely difficult, especially since we're not the harvesters. And secondly, we've been just given an overwhelming job. So our job is not to get overwhelmed and not to get uh, you know, uh, blown out by, the, by the, the, the gigantic task that is before us. Our job is to be faithful with what God has given us and to keep working for the kingdom of God and to do everything we can to minister and influence and, 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 and bring people to an understanding of the kingdom so they can see Christ themselves and be drawn to Jesus and give themselves to Christ. That's the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is to take the kingdom, to take the gospel into all the world and preach the kingdom of God and baptize folks in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. That's our job. That's why it's overwhelming. Now, to that entity, to the church, to the call out. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, the word that is used for church is the word ekklesia. When you see in Greek the word church, it is a translation of the Greek word ekklesia, which means called out ones. Not, not, not whole group of big people, but the ones that are called out of the big group. So even in what our name is implied, uh, compared to all that we have to do, we are a small part. We are called out of a group, like a little small people called out. So the Lord begins to write letters now in the end time to show us how things are. How are things in the world that I'm writing to right now? How are things bef right before all of these supernatural big things begin to happen in these last days? How can my people recognize where they are and what's going on and what they need to do? Because remember, when these letters are being written, these letters to the seven churches, it, you still have time. You still have a moment to repent and be drawn to God and come to God and change your life and have faith in him and trust in him. At the end of each one of these seven letters, there's always a, an invitation given. And the invitation is, uh, you who have ears to hear, you're sitting in the church, but you don't know the Lord. You're sitting in the, in the sanctuary of the godly. You're mixed in and mingled in with the kingdom people, but you have never committed to the kingdom. And you're sitting there looking like everybody else, and you're thinking in your mind, man, I've done everything I need to do, and, I, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you that your life is not given to Christ. Uh, so in the end of every letter, he says, let me tell you what you need to do and what you need to hear. And then he'll challenge you like in verse seven today. You'll see what he says. He says, if you're sitting there and you're lost, if you got ears to hear what the spirit is saying, then he gives you a command about what to do and what's going to be to your benefit if you do it. Amazing. So let's just see what Jesus has to say to the first church, the church at Ephesus. 
to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I'll come back. I'm just going to read them. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say they are apostles and they are not, and you found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Boy, I'd hate to be the Nicolaitans. <laughs> God says he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He, here you go. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, everybody says victorious. victorious. To the person who is victorious, and how do you get victorious? You come to the cross and let the cross change your life. And you become victorious. You become a victor. So he's saying, to those of you who will come to the cross and let victory take over your life, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, here, here is the letter to the church at Ephesus. Remember, there are really four ways that you can apply this. Just quickly, number one, you can apply it uh, individually. I mean, this letter is written to a real church at a real place at a real time. And so you can say, okay, this is information to this church at this time. So I can tell what God was saying to this church at this time. So you can take it individually that way. Uh, Secondly, it's practical. Uh, by that, I mean that this letter could be written to any church in any age because everybody knows that every church and every generation at every age has similar problems. I know it's really easy to have in your heart, boy, if I could have been part of the first church, if I could have been part of the church that was really close to Jesus, then my life would be better. It would have been easier to walk with God. And these seven church letters tell you, no, 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 no. It would be just as difficult back then to believe and walk with God as it is now. Because the same problems that exist now were the same problems they dealt with back then. They just didn't have the internet so everybody could see it every day of every moment of every life. People are people. Look at your neighbor and say, people are people. We have people problems. And the problems are the same over and over because we are all human beings. So, so when we read these, you say, well, okay, I can take this as a student and say, well, that's about that church at that period at that time, and that's what I'm going to take away from here. Or you could say, well, this is a letter that tells us no matter what church you're in, no matter what age that church is in, there are going to be some people like Ephesus, the first people in this example. And then you can take it prophetically, which is real interesting historically, and that is you can take these seven letters to talk about the seven church ages. And I know this might not be something you're interested in, but, but if you're interested in theology and history and scripture and so forth, uh, there have been seven ages of the church. And there have been the first church age, which is the age that this was in, and it was about from about uh, 80 uh, after the death of Christ, Christ died in somewhere around 33, 34 A.D., roughly. So starting in about 50 A.D. or 40 A.D., uh, going on to about 150 A.D., there's a, there's a group of years that <clears throat> was the first churches on the earth after Christ. And then there's a next generation, which would be two, and next generation, which would be three, and next generation. And now we are living in the seventh one of these now, there are how many letters to how many churches? Seven. So this could be, prophetically speaking, you could say, well, this is God's telling us this is how the ages of the church are going to be, and this is the, how the personality and the nature of the church is going to be as we go through those ages. And amazingly so, if you go back and look at certain times in history and certain ages and generations, you'll see that what was happening in society, what it did to the church, how the church responded, where, how it went forward, how it was challenged, you'll find that they correspond perfectly with fitting into seven distinct generations of the church. And you say, what? 
good is that? Well, it's really not any good to you unless the Spirit of God convinces you that when you're in the last one, that there are no more. And what does that mean? Well, that means the seventh one is the last one. And what does that mean? Well, it means the next thing that happened is not going to be another age of the church, another generation of certain characteristics and qualities about God's church. It means that after this generation, there are no more generations, which implies what? He's taking us out of here. There's no church after this, and if we're in the seventh one, guess what? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and nudge and say, there ain't no more. <laughs> Look at him and say, wake up. You don't have another chance, all right? <laughs> Hallelujah. And so you can take it prophetically, or you can take it individually. In other words, you can hear what God says to you, and it can challenge you personally, like in verse 7. It says, Let you, if you have ears, you better hear what God's saying because God might be rescuing you from the last chance that you will possibly have to receive him as king. You got your ears on? You hearing what he's saying? Jesus said, you're listening to me, boy. This is your last chance, buddy. You better put those ears on and you better listen to what I'm saying to you because I'm trying to save your soul. I'm trying to rescue you from all of the things that you're about to read starting in chapter 4 are going to happen to the unrepentant of this world. I'm telling you, from chapter 4 through 22, you know what it's about? The world getting its comeuppance. I know many of you sit around now and say, how can, the, how can these ungodly, wicked people be so prosperous? And I try to serve the Lord in every way, and I can't get ahead. I, I take one step forward and two or three steps backward. They can just seem like just blessings fall out of the sky on them. They never darken the doors of the church. They never pray. They cuss and rant and rave. They're even sorry neighbors. They have pay their bills. And, and it just seems like just blessings fall all over them. And look at me. I'm trying to serve the Lord. And, and, and man, I can't catch a break. I've given my life to Christ. I've, uh, I give my money to the church. I, 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 I try to be disciplined. I try to be righteous. I try to be good. I pray with my kids. I, you know, I pet my dog. I, 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 you know, I, I bring the mailman water when he comes. You know, I mean, I'm, I try to do everything right, and man, I can't get it. And what am I getting for that? Nothing. Yeah, there you go. That's right, Rick. And so this will say to you, okay. In spite of the fact that you do all of that, you need to hear, are you, are you truly saved? Do you truly know the Lord? I mean, I know you look like a, somebody that does, and I know you try to act like somebody who does, but have you yielded yourself? Have you truly surrendered to the Spirit of God? Is this really, like Rick said, is it really all about you? If it's all about you, that's an indication that you've never surrendered to him because it's not about, everybody say, it's not about me. It's about, me. It's about him. So when you read these letters, you say, all right, this is speaking. I'm listening to what it's saying to me. Or you can listen for all of those reasons. But anyway, there you go. There's a couple of choices for you. Let's just see what it says in verse 1 quickly. Verse 1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things who says, he, uh, uh, things, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, you might say, what in the world, uh, why would he say that? Let me just say this to you about each of the seven letters. What you'll find in each letter as he addresses the letter, and who is this speaking? Oh, the one who's speaking, is this John speaking to him? Is it an angel talking to him? Who is it that's speaking to him? It's Jesus himself. Jesus is dictating a letter to an old man on the Isle of Patmos and saying, write these things that I'm saying to you down and I want you to deliver this to the church at Ephesus. And here's what he says. All right, Ephesus, I'm writing to you and if you want to know who I am, I'm the one that's standing in the midst of the lampstands and I'm the one who has the seven stars in his right hand. Referring back to how he describes himself in the first chapter, just a few verses before you remember John said, I, I heard the voice of one that sounded like a trumpet. This voice sounded like a shofar blowing, blah, 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 and loud and everything. And I turned to see who it was. John said, I turned to hear this trumpet voice person to see who it was that was speaking to me. And this is what he saw when he turned. This is out of chapter 1. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like to the Son of Man. Everybody said, that's Jesus. 
clothed with a garment down to his feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. His hair and his head were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. Say, "Uh uh-oh, that's not good. His feet were like fine brass, as if it were refined in a furnace, and the voice, uh, the sound of many waters. His feet were brass, which always represents judgment, and his voice sounded like a thousand Hurricane Katrinas. He had in his hand, right hand, seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. John says his voice was so loud, I could all, I had to put my hands in my ears to be able to even stand it. And he was so bright, I couldn't even look at him. And, 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 and his voice sounded like a, a water, and he had a sword in his hand. And, and, and that was the one. And then the very next verse said, uh, and I, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. So Jesus is just wanting to say in the start of each letter, you need to see me in a certain way. I'm going to say some things to you that are going to challenge you to to have faith and be different. And you're going to have to believe that I I am he who will supply what you need. And so he says, I'm going to represent myself in a way that will encourage you to believe that I have the power to do what I'm saying to you. So every one of these letters, the way he presents himself reflects back to what he said in the first chapter so they'll know, okay, this is the same one that's speaking to us, and this is what he is saying to us, that he's the one who stands in the midst of the lampstands. In other words, he didn't abandon the church. Verse 20 of chapter 1 said, the lampstands are the churches and the stars are the pastors. Everybody say, my pastor is a star. (laughs) Yes, thank you very much. I know we have movie stars, athletic stars, uh, money stars, political stars. We have stars, stars, stars. But I'm going to be a star. I'm going to be held in Jesus' hand. I've always wanted to be. I'm kidding. Y'all know that. But, but. But what what this is an encouragement is, is that even though I'm going to have some negative things to say to you and it's going to be challenging, I want you to know that I'm still standing in the midst of you. In other words, I didn't abandon you. I didn't leave you. You need to know this, that even though there are things that displease me and there are ways that you need to change and and, and buck up and, and repent and so forth, I'm not standing way out here having abandoned you. I'm in the midst of you, and I'm holding your, your, your angels, your pastors in my right hand. So Jesus says, I'm still with you. I'm still empowering you. I'm still speaking to you. I'm still ministering in you. And as long as Jesus Christ is in the midst of us, there's an opportunity for us to change. So he says that. He said, hey, I'm the one who holds these seven stars in my hand, and this is who the letter's from. And, and, and I, want you to, I want you to believe all of that. I want you to know that. So who's writing this letter? Jesus Christ is writing the letter to them, and Jesus is talking to them as a church. Who is this church? This church is the church at Ephesus. Let me just say this to you. I don't think I wrote it in your notes. I I was just trying to scan and see if I actually made that sentence in there, and I don't think it is, so you might want to put this in there. The church at Ephesus is the only one of these churches, these seven churches, who received a letter and an epistle. You say, what's an epistle? It's the wife of an apostle. No, I'm kidding. No. (laughs) Now, an epistle is, 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 a, is a letter, like a, almost like a gospel. An epistle is a letter from, uh, from a prophet, from, from a God's man. And the book of Ephesians in your Bible, are you aware there's a book of Ephesians in your Bible? A whole book called the book of Ephesians. And it was Paul himself, an apostle of God, writing a letter, this big long letter, to the church at Ephesus to talk to them about what they needed to know and to reveal things the Holy Spirit wanted him to reveal. And that book, that that epistle is what it's called, made it into the canon of the scriptures and become a book of the Bible called the book of Ephesians. It's a big letter. So the church at Ephesus not only received this letter from Jesus at the end of time, it also received an epistle, which tells you this is a great church. This is a significant church. This is a church that has a lot of history and a lot of happening and, and that the, the Spirit of God and that Jesus considered it worthy to, to speak to them, encourage them, correct them, and keep them moving forward in life. The church at Ephesus was a great church when it began. You need to know this, 
This church began about 55, 56 AD, so it was very close to right after Jesus' death. It was established on the third missionary journey of Paul. And, and you don't, the only thing important about that to know is that once Paul landed in the city of Ephesus and he began to find a group of believers that would hear the word and listen to what he had to say, he stayed there with them for almost three years. You say, wow, man, that's a, well, in comparison of the time that he stayed other places, uh, Paul didn't stay other places very long, maybe a few weeks or a month or something. He stayed here almost three years. If you want to read one of the most exciting and thrilling chapters in the Bible, read Acts 19. You know, get your Bible. That's like a little book, right? <laughs> a book that's got these other books, you know, in it. And then one of them says Acts Get in Acts and look at chapter 19, and you will see how the church at Ephesus got started. Every bit of chapter 19 is thrilling. It's exciting stuff happened in, in the city of Ephesus. Yeah, in the city of Ephesus, the very, one of the very first things that happened is uh, there were a little tiny group of Christians that Paul found when he got to the city of Ephesus, and he came to them, and here's what he said, and you might remember what he said. Some of you that have been church in your life, and you've, especially if you've been in charismatic ministry or Holy Spirit ministry and stuff like that, you'll hear this one, because this is one that is talked about about all of these tongues and prophecies and blah, blah, blah. This is one of the passages that are used. The Apostle Paul looks at these little tiny group of believers, and he says, uh, ha have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? In other words, I see that you're believers. I see that you're here because you, you, you want Christ and that you understand about Christ and that you've separated your life about Christ. But I want to ask you this. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed in Christ? And you know what they said to him? We don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, well, then, unto whom were you baptized? In other words, whose name were you baptized in? And they said, we were baptized by John. John who? John the Baptist, who baptized people in the Jordan River for what purpose? The Bible says, for repentance of their sin. John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. John, John was not baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John was before Jesus. John was the predecessor of Jesus. It was the mission of the John to get out there and scorch the earth with the message, you better repent because somebody's coming that I'm not worthy to untie his shoelaces. You better repent of your sin. You better turn from your unrighteousness or else you're going to burn, baby. Turn or burn. Get right or get left. Change your stroke or go up in smoke. I'm telling you, you... You better get right with God. And people would go, people would run down to the Jordan River to be baptized. And John would baptize them in repentance of sin, not in newness of life. And so these Ephesian believers were people who had heard John the Baptist speak and were convinced that somebody was coming one day. And so they better quit all that sin going on in their life. And they said, you're right. And they ran in the river and got baptized by John the Baptist, ran out and ran back to whatever part of the world they came from and just sat there and saying, you know, one of these days something's going to happen. We don't know what it is, but something's going to happen somewhere that's going to really change and affect our lives. And, and, now, and now the Apostle Paul comes into the city and he's preaching about this Jesus and he's preaching about these kingdom of God and these things like that. And they go down there to hear him and he looks at him and says, have you received the Holy Spirit? And they said, man, we don't even know if there is one. And he says, well, who baptized? What, in what name were you baptized? And they said, John the Baptist. And he said, well, come here, man. And Paul laid his hand on them and spoke a word over them and then they got filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to prophesy and speak in languages they never did. They began to do the same thing that happened to that group of believers on the day of Pentecost in the city of Jerusalem who were all Jewish. You say, what a crazy, wacky way to do things. No, it wasn't. It makes perfect sense. Why? Well, all of these Ephesians were Gentiles. Or they were in a Gentile city. They weren't in Jerusalem. They weren't in the temple. So the Holy Spirit of God was just basically saying to the world, it doesn't matter where you are, the same Holy Spirit's going to fill you, do the same things he did with the original bunch. You're not getting cheated. You're not getting shortchanged. He's going to do the same thing he did back then wherever you are. This was a sign to the believers and a sign to the world that as the Holy Spirit empowered your life, that, the, that God was empowering you. That happened at Ephesus. Man, what a start of a church. 
What a great beginning of a church. It's unbelievable. And then you know what else began to happen? Miracles. Miracles began to happen. Man, people began to bring sick people down to Paul's house. He would touch them and they'd be saved. They'd be healed of whatever disease they had. If they couldn't make it down to the house, you know what Paul would do? He would take handkerchiefs and he would bless the handkerchiefs and send them down there. And when the people would touch the sick one with the handkerchief, all of a sudden they'd be made well. Woo, I guess that's where these, these charlatans live around today. That's why you get one of these in the mail. You, you, know, you know, this is the passage they'll use to say that and just say, well, all right, bless God. I wish you were Paul. But you no, know, uh, but that, was, that, that legitimately began to happen. And man, the whole city began to stir millions of people. And they didn't even have TV, man. I mean, this wasn't even on the TV or the internet or anywhere. And all the people of the, all the city began to stir around this and all that kind of stuff. And they began to, Paul began to cast out demons. And people who were filled with evil demon spirits would come and Paul would cast them out. And, and people were so impressed with that, they said, you know, I want to cast me a demon out. And there was a family who had a dad by the name of Sceva, S-C-E-V-A, I believe it is. Don't know him, never met him, but, you know, that was his name. Bible tells us the sons of Sceva. And he had seven boys. And these seven boys were so impressed with the fact that Paul could cast out demons and demons would come out of people, evil demon spirits, that they said, you know what we want to do? We want to cast us out a demon. They said, let's go find one and cast him out. Acts 19, read it, it's right there. And so they come upon somebody that's filled with a demon and they look at that person and they say, in the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, come out of him. And you know what? The demon looked back at them and said, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And the demon jumps on them and tears their clothes off of them beats them up, roughs them up a little bit, and the Bible says, and they run out of the house naked and, and screaming. Oh, yeah. Everybody say real stuff. Man, what an exciting start to a church. Woo! Boy, wouldn't you like to be in that little bunch of people? And I'm just reminding you that it was only about 50 people, maybe even less than that. Can you imagine a little raggedy bunch of people Barely saved, barely come to the kingdom of God, no knowledge, no stir. Uh, I mean, meeting in some little dingy church building on the corner of the street somewhere in some little strip mall somewhere, uh, rattling the whole Ephesian city of millions of people with gigantic uh, demonic religious power there. Good night, man. It caused such a stir that there was a guy named Demetrius the silversmith he made silver idols to the goddess Diana. There was a big temple. I'll tell you a second about that if you got a time. But he made little silver statues, and he was a member of a, of a union. And he called a big union meeting of all the silversmiths. And he said, hey, this little bunch down here that's meeting on such and such street, that little handful of uh, fanatics down there, are causing us, our business, to go bad. Our business is to make silver statues to the goddess Diana who has this gigantic temple. The temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's about as big as this shopping center that we're in. One temple about big as this whole shopping center we're in. Had 100, 130 columns out in front, 37 of them. They were 16 feet around and 130 feet high. Or I think maybe 90, 80, what 130. Big, gigantic. I mean, 16, uh, 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 37 of those columns had uh, emeralds, diamonds, uh, sapphires, rubies, blah, 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 all the way from top to bottom, wrapped all the way around. Uh, enormous, elaborate, uh, gigantic. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The temples, temple to the goddess Diana had a thousand temple prostitutes in there serving the temple. No, I don't know what they were doing. Prostitutes. Because God, Tim, Diana was the goddess of fertility, the goddess of sex. And so in the temple, I mean, part of the service was sexual and so forth. It was so full of demonic energy. Let me just tell you this. It was so full of demonic energy, the temple became housing for two really notorious things of the day. One is it was a place for criminals to go and hide because no good person would go in there. Man, a criminal could do something and run into the temple of Diana and the police wouldn't go in after him. 
because there was so much demonic activity, they were scared to death that a demon might jump on them. And, and if they went in there, their wives would kill them when they went home. <laughs> so criminals had a place to hide. So the temple became a place for criminals to run and hide and not worry about being caught. And secondly, it became a banking center of the whole uh, section of the Roman Empire. And you say, banking? Yes, I said banking. Because your money was safe in the temple of Diana. You know why? Why? Because the big crooks wouldn't let the little crooks steal your money. And everybody was scared to go in there because it was full of demonic activity. And I don't care what kind of heathen you are, you're scared of demonic activity. And if you weren't scared of that, the big boys would make sure that you didn't prosper. You're not going to steal their money and get away with it. So it became a banking center for all the corruption of the world. Now here comes the Apostle Paul and this little bunch of Ephesian believers meeting in some parking lot alley down on some backside of nowhere with 50 of them, and they are shaking the world, man. They are rattling the kingdom of the devil and temples, Diana's temple, and they're telling people that these little silver statues are nothing. They don't have any of the power of God in them. They're nothing. You don't need that. It's an idol. Quit worshiping it, and people quit buying it. And the silversmith's union said, we didn't have a union meeting. Yeah, this cat right down here is teaching everybody not to buy an idol, and my business is suffering for that, and he's going to us, us, run us slam out of business if we don't do something about this. And they began just causing an uproar and a ruckus and all that kind of stuff. And, and the whole town got all out of shape and bent up. And they had a big town meeting. Looked like some of these political rallies you see now where you got all these demonstrators and all these people, you know, and just ranting and raving and, and blah about everything to do with this whatever other bunch. I mean, it was just wild chaos. And the whole city said, Diana, Diana, she's our girl. And, 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 it, and it finally, and it finally, you know, the whole crowd became so stirred up against Paul and this little Ephesian church that they would have taken them and dragged them and hung them up or put them on a cross or killed them or something like that. And it said, as the town clerk, I don't know who he was, but he must have been influential somehow. The town clerk, you know, I'm thinking like Barney Fife on Andy and Mayberry or something. I, I, I mean, just a simple little name, town clerk, and the town clerk uh, waves his arm and quiets the crowd, and the town clerk says, hey, hey, just in case you forgot about it, if we do this terrible thing, it's going to, somebody's going to tell Rome hey, somebody's going to report us to, <laughs> to the authorities and they're going to come down here because we did this terrible thing and they're going to start putting the thumb on us. And so, hey, we might want to reconsider what we're doing here. And the, cry, and, the, and the crowd quieted and everything settled down and they were able to get away. That miracle. Look at your neighbor and say, that's a miracle. Bunch of roused up, soaked up, drunked up, uh, demoned up people, uh, sit down and, 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 and uh, stop their anger because of somebody saying the Roman Rome's going to get us. But the point is, the point is, I'm saying, would you like to be a part of that church? I mean, if you were, if you were going to church, would you like to say, well, uh, what did your church do last week? Well, <laughs> my church, I'm, I'm telling you what, we had a bunch of demons cast out of the temple of Diana. What? Man, that's the real thing. I, I'm just trying to show you what kind of start this place had. This, play, this letter is going to a church that was real, dynamic. I mean, it had a tremendous start. Just to give you one little comparison example, the church at Thyatira, which also receives one of these letters, you know how long it took to establish the church at Thyatira? Three weeks. Three weeks. Man, that's, that's quick to form a church, three weeks. You know how many? We've been a church 10 years. 10 years, they were church three weeks. Quick. I mean, I'm just saying it's quick. You know how long it took to establish a church at Ephesus? Three years. Three years just to say this church had a lot of grounding. The Apostle Paul established the church. Timothy was their first pastor. Aquila and Priscilla, the great husband and wife team of teachers, ministered there. Apollos, the flaming orator of the kingdom of God, preached sermons there in evangelism. I'm just saying they heard... They heard the real big shots of the kingdom of God for their day. They were ministered to by the anointed ministers of the kingdom of God. They were grown and nurtured by, by, by tremendous people of real faith and real. I, I'm just trying to show you that this church, 
There was a reason why this church had a hot heart for God and a love for Jesus and a fervor for the kingdom of God because they were started in such a fiery uh, kingdom, apostolic, revival attitude of life. But here they are 40 years after that and Jesus is having to say something negative to them. Oh, by the way, just another one just popped up on my mind. They, the, the whole city of Ephesus got so fired up about the message they were hearing. Now listen, this is a testimony. The Bible says that they began to burn books of magic. They had books of magic in their home to learn how to cast spells and do demonic things and so forth. And these books cost money. And they brought all these books to the center of town. And the Bible says that they burned books worth 50,000 pieces of silver. I mean, it tells you in the scripture, and it cost 50, these books were worth 50,000 pieces of silver. That's not an excited preacher trying to exaggerate to you. The Bible says it cost 50. Now, just to show you what that means, one piece of silver was equal to one day's wage. Cost you, cost you, you buy a book, it costs you a whole day's labor to pay for one piece of silver. And they burned these books up that were 50,000 pieces of silver. No wonder the union, Smith, the, the silversmiths union were having a meeting. <laughs> Boy, the economy was being disrupted. Things were going bad for the demons in the realm of there. And that was the church that Jesus wrote. Man, they were on a big river, and they were called Luminasia. Ephesus was named Lumen, which means the light of Asia. It was called the light of Asia, the big city, the light of Asia. The harbor in the city on the river Castor was one mile wide. All of the goods that went into Asia came through Ephesus. Fascinating city, tremendously Impactful, And it was in this city that the Spirit of God moved to start a little struggling group of believers meeting down at the end of an alley somewhere where there was only about 50 or 60 of them to shake the continent of Asia. You say, we're not big enough. We're not significant enough. I'm just saying, this is what fervor for the kingdom of God will do. And it was to this church Jesus wrote, I know it's time to go, y'all. I'm sorry. He says, I know your labor. I know your works and your labor and your patience. Labor means your sweating toil like I'm doing right now. I know your sweating toil. In other words, I know, I know you know how to work. That's a good word to the church nowadays, isn't it? Well, I mean, right? I'm not expecting any amens, seriously. I mean, don't say amen. Just sit there. I know your works. I know you're sweating toil. You know what Jesus is saying to him? Man, I'm proud of the fact you know how to work. You see, we're a, what are we? A, a generation of spectators, right? Come in, give me a good seat, man. I got to be able to see. Entertain me so I can be happy about it. Do everything you can to tell me all the good stuff so I'll feel good when I go out of there. And if I like it, I might come back. Yeah, do a little dance for me. You know, uh, do a little jig, perform a miracle, speak a word. It's our generation. You know what we need to hear Jesus say? You need to work. The kingdom of God is not about watching. The kingdom of God is about working. Jesus says to them, you're a bunch of good workers, and I commend that. I know your labor and your patience. Patience means enduring uh, our, our understanding endurance. In other words, you take a licking and keep on ticking. You're there every week. You're not one of those that flies in at the good times and flies out at the bad times. You're not one of those who gets up and you got a little hanging toenail and you say, you know, are we going to church today? I don't know. I don't really feel good. Or I would, but you know, I stayed up last night. I mean, I, I'm just saying, what is he saying to us? I mean, you can let this talk to the church at Ephesus if you want to, but God's pointing his finger straight at us. 
And he's saying, I'm telling you, you know what? You know what? You have people in your church just like this. Some of you are wonderful. You endure, you labor, you work hard, you sweat for the kingdom, you talk, you don't just look, you, you, you endure, you hang in there, you're here when you're sick, you just do whatever you need to do because that's what needs to be done. And glory to God, and Jesus has a word of commendation to you. And, you, and, and, and you've tried those that are evil and you found them to be liars. In other words, people have come into your congregation to try to warp the kingdom of God and try to teach bad stuff and foolish things, and you've stood true and not let them come in. People came to the church at Ephesus and wanted to teach them, man, you got to obey the law. If you don't obey the law, you're not going to be saved anymore. People came in and said, now that you are saved and you name the name of Jesus Christ, you can do anything you want to. You can live any way. You can commit all the sin you want to sin because it's only your soul that goes to heaven and you've committed your heart to Jesus. And so it doesn't matter what you do with your body. All that matters is what you've done with your spirit. That's called libertarianism. There was a deacon that was elected in the first church. He was Deacon Nicholas. Read Acts chapter 6, verse 5, and you'll see him listed there. The church ordained deacons because there was too much work for the preachers to do. They said, let's elect us seven men full of the Holy Spirit that we can turn these things over to so that we'll have time to study the Word and minister to the people and all that. We don't have time to take somebody to the grocery store and make sure somebody gets groceries and make sure somebody else's kid gets picked up from school. And all. I mean, we got too much work to do. Let's elect us some helpers. And they elected seven men, and one of them was named Nicholas. Verse 6 said, I hate the, doctrine, I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. There he is, Deacon Nicholas started a movement in the church where he taught them, hey, don't worry about how you live, man. It's your soul. That's what you got to worry about. Jesus lives in your heart. Your heart can't sin because Jesus lives in there. But it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Live together, sleep with somebody you're not married to, steal money. Do, I mean, do whatever you want to. Jesus said, hey, you know, one of the good things I got to say about you is you hate that deeds just like I do. Bless God. You've tested those who said they're apostles, but they're liars. You found out they are liars. You've stood firm on the word of God. It's unbelievable. And also they had professional beggars came to the church. Professional leeches. You know what they did? They begged the church for money so that the money that was given by the people to take the kingdom of God and go forward out there and minister the gospel to the world would be wasted on professional beggars who would leech the money instituted for the kingdom of God onto their sorry selves so that there wouldn't be enough money to go out to the world. Let me tell you something. God gives us these resources. You know why? To minister the gospel of the kingdom of God, not to support people who won't work for a living and have some kind of dysfunctional lifestyle. We're not enablers. We're to be wise about that. But there were a group of professional beggars that came to the church at Ephesus and tried to convince them, well, you're Christian, so you've got to help me. And Jesus said, Pfft. if you don't work, you don't eat. How about that? If you want to learn how to eat, work. You want to prosper, work. I got a cure for... The lack in your life is spelled W-O-R-K. Get a job. So Ephesus endured all that. And Jesus said, I'm going to commend you because you did all of that. That's the kind of church you are. What a great church. I know it's time to go, y'all. I'm sorry. I mean, I hate to just stop, but it's way past time. I'm preaching way too long. Can I, can I just, I guess I'll have to start over. Man, y'all will never come back. I'm sorry. They've already turned their computers off on the internet, I'm sure. They don't watching this anymore. Let me just, let me just, I promise you, can I wrap it up? Because I don't want to come back to this next week. The next letter is just the same. I mean, it's just this different group, and it's got some more stuff, but it's really dynamic. And he says, I found them to be liars. I'm, I'm, I'm moving. And you have persevered and have patience, and you've labored. Why did they do all this for my name's sake, is what he said. Why'd you do it? Because you love me. That's why you did it. You've persevered. You've labored. You've done all this work. Why? For you? No. For my name's sake. I, I see. It's, and you've but not become weary. Uh, and then there's the, you know, I've got this little deal. Uh, good thing to say about you. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. By the way, just remember that phrase, deeds of the Nicolaitans. 
Acts of the Nic Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans were doing some things that were uh, stirring up the church. So just remember the fact that at the first church in the first age, the first right off the bat, there were some Nicolaitans who were trying to spread uh, a heresy in the church and it was called deeds in this first church. Just put that in the back of your memory bank. Uh, and, and, and he says, you hate them, and I hate them, and we're going to destroy them. Uh, so what's wrong? What's right about the church? You've labored, you've worked, you've had patience, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. All right, now what's wrong? What's wrong with the church? Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Everybody say left. I'm just distinguishing that from the word lost. You know, it's one thing to lose your first love. It's another thing to leave it. To leave it, in, it, it uh, indicates a conscious rejection of it, right? To leave it means I know I'm walking away from it. I make a choice to move away from it. To lose it means somehow I, I can't find it. I, it got lost. It was happenstance. It was a a moment of neglect, and I, I don't know what happened. I wish I could find it. You know, I mean, to leave something is different than losing something. It's kind of like, kind of like losing your salvation. You can't lose your salvation. I know people say, "Oh, yeah, 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 yeah." No, you're wrong. You cannot lose your salvation. You can lose your fellowship, which means you can get your back end torn up by the kingdom of God and by Jesus, Holy Spirit. You can get put in another room so you can't eat supper with the family. You can be ashamed to walk into the presence of God. Everybody say fellowship. First John, you say first John. First John is all, it doesn't say anything about your relationship. It says everything about your fellowship. First John is about the consequences of not living right. Once you've come to Christ, you lose your fellowship, not your relationship. A lot of difference in that. I don't care. Justin's my son. If Justin robs a bank, he's still my son. He can't, I, he can't walk away from the relationship. Now, he, he robs a bank. He's in the big house somewhere. I might not come see him. We might not have fellowship together because I'm shamed or whatever it might be, mad, whatever it might be. But I'm still related and he's still my son, no matter how much our fellowship is messed up. We have a relationship. When you commit your heart to Christ, what did Paul say in Philippians? He said, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That means when I commit something to Christ, he can keep it until the day of judgment. The only way to get me away from Christ is to pry myself out of his hands. I'm going to ask you, who can pry? Here's you. Here's, here, here's, here's God's hand. Here's you. Here's God. You're saved. Who's going to unwrap the hand of God from around you? If, if, if somebody can, that ought to be God. That's right. Nothing can separate. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm wild now. I'm, I'm sorry. But anyway, I, I, I want to say this one thing to you, and I'm quitting. I'm finished. I'm finished. All right, you left your first love. Now, let me show you how this might apply. You got your ears on? How it might apply to somebody sitting right here in this congregation. Now, I want you to hear this. All right, this is what to do about it. He said, all right, here's what's wrong. You left your first love. In other words, you don't have a hot heart for me anymore. I'm not your heartthrob. I used to be your heartthrob. When you saw me, your heart quickened. When I walked into the room and you felt my presence, it was a, ooh. I mean, there were, there were tingles running up and down your spine that were little icy fingers when your eyes met mine, <laughs> whatever. I mean, I used to do something to you when you saw me, man. It just infected you physically. It was like, whew, my love. Now, you've cooled off. Now, that doesn't happen anymore. And that doesn't mean you don't love me anymore, but you don't love me like you used to, is what he said. It doesn't mean you've turned your back on me and you've turned away and you've walked away from the kingdom. It just means you've gotten casual about our relationship and I no longer ring your bell. I used to ring your bell, but now I no longer ring your bell. And I can hear some of us saying, well, it's no wonder because, you know, there's so many things happening in life, and my life is full of the kids and baseball and, and, and school and sports and work and life and money and bank and tragedy. And I, my, my life, my mind is so full of stuff. I can't just, you know, I know, yeah. I know. And so was theirs. That's the issue. The issue is all of our minds are full of all kinds of things. And who gets pushed to the back? 
the one that used to be our heart throb. That's the point of this. You left your first love. Now, that can happen in your life too, right? Your husband, your wife, you, you know, whoever it might be. You used to love them. They used to be the throb of your heart. Now everything's grown cold and indifference. And you, I mean, you still love them, but I mean, hey, it's not like it used to be. How do you get it back? Here's how you get it back. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Everybody say, I use my mind. I'm, not, I'm trying to help you now. This is worth wake up. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to tell you how to get your hot heart back. If you don't have a hot heart for what used to be your heart throb, how do you get it back? Here it goes. All right, quick. One, I use my mind. It involves my mind. Remember, remember from where you have fallen. In other words, remember what it used to be like when you did have a hot heart for them. Use your mind and think back of what it used to be like. Do a little imaging in your mind. Do a little reflecting in your mind. Do a little, do, 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 do a little search back in there and go, oh, yeah, man, she looks so good. Ooh, yeah, baby, I remember that. Oh, glory to God. Or he was wonderful, good night, man, even my man. Oh, yeah. Use your mind to remember what it was like when your dad had a hard heart. And then he said, and repent. What does repent mean? Repent means turn around. It means change your direction. <laughs> Repent. It's an action. It's a decision you make in your soul. I use my mind to remember I quit doing what I'm doing. Quit looking at that pornography on the internet at night. It's stealing your first love. It's stealing that, that hot heart. Quit looking at other women that at work. Quit wearing stuff that they like. Throw that perfume or that cologne that somebody complimented you on because you want to smell like what they want to. Quit doing the stuff that's taking you away from your heart throb. Is that too personal? I'm just trying to help you. You say you don't love him like you used to. I'm just trying to tell you what the Bible says you need to do about that. I need to get a divorce. No, you don't. You need to hear what God says. Think about what it was like. Use your mind. Fantasize. And then quit doing that stuff that's taking you away. Not just think about it and say, you know, I ought not do that. That's not repentance. That's regret. <clears throat> repentance means I do something about it. I turn away from it. And then, what does it say? And do the first works. That's something I do with my body. In other words... I fantasize like it used to be. That's going to stir up some stuff in me, some remembrance and blah. And then I stop doing stuff that's taking me in the wrong direction and start walking in the right direction again. And then, and, and then I start doing what I used to do when I did have a hot heart for God. I open the door. I call them honey. I sit by them with my hand or arm around them on the couch. I shake hands. I, I, I nestle them at night. I, you know, I mean, whatever it is that I used to do, I'd do the first works again. And that'll get, my hot, that'll get my heart going again toward them. Now he says, if you don't do this, I'm going to remove your lampstand from its place. What is the lampstand? Tell me. Lampstand is the church, the one who stands in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. What does a lampstand do? Shines light. What's the purpose of a church? Shine light in the world. He said, if you don't do this, I'm going to take your church away from you. I'm moving out. And did he do it? Yes, he did. Find Ephesus on the map today. You know what happened? The silt in the river began to clog up the harbor. Shut down commerce. Hmm. Yeah, Caster River. Moved its mouth and blah, blah, blah. Cities used to be here. Boop, now it's just a map on a dead dirt hole. When the church begins to dry up, the city begins to dry up. If there's no light, corruption comes in. Darkness comes in. If there's no salt, corruption takes over, blah, blah. Within a few, within a few 50 years or so, the city of Ephesus, bloop, gone. Church of Ephesus, bloop, gone. Why? Because they didn't do what he said. He said, if you don't do it, I'm coming and taking it away from you. 
I'm just saying he's serious. Look at your neighbor and say he's serious. And then verse 7, everybody say, thank the Lord. He who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says. If you'll, if, you'll, if you'll overcome, if you'll be the victor, I'll give you to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the Garden of Eden. I've got it in your notes, but just suffice it to say, that's a promise to you. That's a promise to those of you who are sitting here in this church who don't know the Lord. You know what he's saying to you? You better listen. This is serious business. I'm saying to you, if you'll go to the, to the cross, the cross will give you victory. The, the word tree is used in the Bible quite often. The same word that is translated tree is translated cross. The cross was a tree on G, which Jesus died on. The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, and when men, when men fell, they put angels, God put angels, seraphim angels, around the opening of the Garden of Eden so man couldn't come back in and eat of the tree of life and stay alive forever in his evil, unrepentant body. That was an act of grace, by the way. To keep us from living forever lost. Well, in the book of Revelation, would it surprise you to found that the, book was, that the Garden of Eden that was closed down in Genesis is opened back up in Revelation. And in the last chapter, 22, one of the rewards in heaven is we're going to go into the midst of the paradise of God and eat of the tree of life. So man that was banished from the tree of life in Genesis is going to be invited to the tree of life in Revelation. And you hear what Jesus is saying. Now listen, you say, what does that mean? Well, let me tell you. What it means is, if you know the Lord, you're going to get to go to heaven when you die. And when you get there, you're going to get to go in the midst of paradise. And the tree of life is going to be there. And Jesus is going to say, hey, come eat of the tree of life. And you're going to get to go and eat freely of the tree of life, which is in par midst of paradise in the garden of life. But if you stay there, lost, well, the rest of the book is about you. I'm saying this is an act of invitation. It's an act of grace and mercy. It's an act of God saying, you got another chance. Come on, take it while you got it. Examine your heart. This is a promise. If you'll do this, you'll get to go to heaven. You'll, 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 you'll get off of, that, off of that list that's going the opposite way. So, I mean, really, it just suffice it. I'm just encouraging you. Listen, listen to what the Spirit of God said. Do you know him? I mean, this is serious business, guys. Do you know him? Hey, this is his invitation to you. Yeah, come to a relationship. Hey, I know, I know you come to church, but do you know him? I know you know some scripture, but do you know him? I know you stand up and clap and rejoice when the people sing, but do you know him? Hey, that's what he's talking about. And he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's stand our feet. Let's go.